beloved clergy, Malfono, Michael Wingard, all those who are gathered here. This is a great occasion for our mission chapel as we conduct this Suryak Orthodox Icon Exhibition and as part of that we are conducting a series of lectures and uh, discussions about the Suryak image and theology. Especially today we will be focusing on an interesting topic, image and theology in Suryak tradition. And we have uh, the best person for this topic to be introduced, Dr. Michael Wingard, PhD. He has a PhD in Near Eastern Language and Cultures from UCLA. He has been teaching in different universities like Fuller Theological College, Seminary, I mean, UCLA, and he has been instrumental in building a Agora University, an online Oriental Orthodox University. And he has been serving as the Dean of the Holy Transfiguration College since then, as part of the Agora University. With that brief introduction, let me welcome Dr. Michael Winker to introduce the topic, Suryak Image and Theology in Suryak Tradition. So the lecture is for 30 minutes and following the lecture you will have the opportunity to ask questions or interact with the presenter. So thank you Dr. Malfono. Oh, thank you. Uh, I mean you know this is a personal note like you know uh, our beloved uh, Matthew Sachin, myself, Zebi, we all are your students. That's a blessing. I hope so. <laughs> If, right. uh, if he teaches anything wrong, blame me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Welcome, Malfona. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for the warm introduction and Baruch um, Morabuna. Does anyone remember me from before? Yes. From like 15 years ago? Yes. Yeah, you're Rena's family, right? No? No. I know your faces. Sorry, I don't know you guys. Uh, <clears throat> I just have a couple nice words to return, right? So um, Abuna or Achen gave me some kind words. Some of them, you know, may have been uh, spiced with exaggeration. I don't know about best, you know, but thank you very much. Um, I came here as to St. Ignatius, actually I think it was St. Mary at the time, but I came to Dallas maybe 16 years ago when um, Zach Chem Achen, um, was still around and I first got to know him before he was ordained to the priesthood and that set off sort of this long trajectory for me um, in my own career uh, I ended up going different places talking not because I have anything interesting to say I just sound interesting when I say it okay that it's it's more the sizzle than the steak if you can put it that way uh, and it was shortly thereafter that I got into, you know, my own doctoral studies and um, what I saw of Dallas and the community here always impressed me, I think, and I told Renjan Achen, Father Renjan, this uh, when I got here, I go, you know, this is the jewel of North America, this place, the St. Ignatius community. Um, for many of you, this might be a small church if you're visiting from, you know, a different community. But for the Syrian Orthodox community, and indeed for the Malankara branch of the Syrian Orthodox community, this place um, is impressive on multiple levels, and it starts with the people. So it couldn't be here, it couldn't be done without the people, so thank you all very much. Um, today, I'm talking, well, now, okay, now we have a Corpiscopa coming, but I was going to start, you know, how the, the typical... Um, you know, Thirumeni is here, I'd say Thirumeni, Goropiskupen Mare, Achen Mare, Shemachen, you know, and go down the list of things, but um, I'll just continue on. Uh, today's talk is in the context of what's been happening downstairs and upstairs. We have an icon exhibition going on, and this exhibition highlights iconography in the Syriac tradition, but it's a little different if you're used to a Coptic tradition, if you're used to a Greek tradition, a Russian, something in between, Ethiopic, etc. 
The Syriac tradition is unique in a number of ways. And really, what we're talking about here today, at this, this present time, is not necessarily the icon themselves, although I'll have a couple examples, but the thinking behind the very process. The thinking that we need to engage in in order to live in and with icons. Next slide, please. That's why I'm calling it image and theology, right? Like, that's kind of the key. I want you to think about um, the matter of iconography or image even beyond the icon. The icon being a product, the image being something else going on. I hope I don't go too close to these microphones. So I would say today's an opportunity. Um, I think that what we have here is the opportunity not just for people to learn about icons, but for us, um, and I'm speaking maybe more to those who are in the Syriac Orthodox community, to re-engage a practice that has receded. It's had a couple peaks, um, but mostly valleys in our history. And so I want us to ask, why does our tradition of iconography seem so subdued when compared to other traditions we may be familiar with? I referenced the Greeks or the Copts, um, the Ethiopian church. If you walk into any of those churches, you'll be met with the, the can I say, glaring um, presence of icons. They came, all of those traditions came to that place over time. They didn't happen overnight and they're the result of a process. We too are the result of a process that sometimes gets confused for what our standard is, mostly because our standards have changed over time. Um, well, let's talk about where icons come from. Next um, slide, please. There's different types. When we think about icons, it's easy to think, like you can go to a, uh, a bookstore or orthodox store or online website or something and purchase an icon if you want. You can put it up in your home and you should and maybe you have an icon corner. Um, so now we think of icons as these tangible things. When they started more, um, as just different images or imagery. I'll, I'll use the word pictures, okay? Most of those were on frescoes that later were moved to, you know, the, the paneled or the, um, I'll say canvas, but I mean that in the general sense, not in the a material, um, cotton material sense. Um, but most of our icons are found in manuscripts. They're not found on the walls. You don't see an iconostasis. That's not part of our tradition. You'll find most of them in texts. In fact, if you go downstairs, you're looking really at a showcase of miniatures or of illuminated manuscripts. So what do these icons look like as they're textualized? Uh, another way, if you look on the bottom left, this is um, a photo from Tur Abdin in Turkey where the curtain, the veil that separates the sanctuary area, these are often decorated with um, textile-based icons, almost like a tapestry, you could say. This is prevalent in that part of our church. It's maybe not so much in Syria, but this, this area of southeast Turkey, just north of the Syrian border, near the Iraqi border. Um, the other, of course, well, I think I said frescoes. So the one in the center is a fresco. Um, I'm going to guess what that is. Just looking at it. Jonah. Yeah, it's interesting that the inscription that tells you what it is, it's actually in Arabic. It's not in Syriac. It's written in Syriac letters. And so this is a, process, this is a phenomenon called Garshuni, where you write... Um, Arabic language with the Syriac script. This is from um, Homs, I think it's in Sadad city. Um, so we have the tradition across many different media, right? It's not going to, like what we have here today um, is obviously an evolved form, it's an organized form. It sort of represents what's manageable and comparable with other churches that may have icons. 
uh, in their own tradition. For us, however, they're mostly um, found in manuscripts of these days. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, next slide, please. Um, the reasons typically for this have to do with no iconoclastic controversy in our church. So in the Greek church, for example, or the, we'll call it the Byzantine, the Roman uh, church at this time, there's a controversy about the use of images. And so they actually have the debate go on and the um, iconophiles, if I can call them that, um, the people who support icons win the day. And so there is what we could call a reaction against it because icons were removed from their churches. Well, we didn't have it. Um, our church tended to be the poorer church. We didn't have imperial sponsorship. We also were village churches. So there's the matter of logistics. Um, what does it cost to produce these things? Who's gonna be trained to produce them and incorporate them into church structure? So what we have is a very basic structure, simplistic structure. But again, as you saw with the frescoes, it's not out of the realm of our tradition to have wall art um, or even curtain, not art, it's, it's not art, right? To have walled icons in, in fresco format or icons upon the curtains or when we open our scripture to see iconography. Um, we can only and have historically only really engaged it in manageable forms. Um, interestingly, and I forget the name of this church, someone can raise their hand if they know off the top of their head, but there's a church in Kerala that um, was there before the Portuguese landed and either fully destroyed or partially destroyed or they're doing renovations and getting rid of, um, I saw ruins, right? But there's images, there's icons that were part of the church that pre-existed the Portuguese. So even in Kerala, icons are part of our tradition. Now, it doesn't mean the church is spackled in icons, right? Or that we have icons of icons, but imagery is present. And one thing I really wanna get across this evening is that icons, and I'll say, I'm gonna say it um, strictly in the beginning, I'm gonna say they're not art, okay? Um, they don't convey sentiment or drama the way you would maybe compose a piece of art. These days you go to a museum, you can sit in a museum or a stand and you can you know, really um, just view and appreciate what the painter or, or sculptor or whatever the artist is trying to convey through um, the piece. Ours aren't that way. We know them by their form. We know them by their form. Now, next slide, please. Please, okay. So, um, well, I may, I may have a slide out of order. Um, would it be okay if I hit you at the end? Okay. So, uh, go back to the previous slide so I remember what I was talking about because this is a shift in, in my brain. Okay, so <laughs> when I say they're not art, I'm not, lying to you, I wouldn't do that to you, okay? But I, I'm ex exaggerating for a point, for purpose. It's because I don't want you to think of them as art. What I really mean to say is, you mustn't reduce icons to art, okay? Sure, they are, a, you know, imagery, visual arts are a category. Um, but what I want present in your head is that when you encounter these things, you're not encountering art per se, the same way you would maybe in someone's home, maybe in a museum, maybe in a public space. Okay, back to the next slide. So where do we need to even begin our conversation? Really, it goes to something a little more basic, and that's theology. Theology is our attempt to wrestle with what it means to be created, what it means to be human, and how our relationship is with the divine based on that. Icons are just as much a part of that conversation as music, the liturgy, etc. And there's a couple foundational elements that are particular to the Syriac tradition. Now, 
we could just as easily say these are orthodox principles. Um, I've taken them out this way because they're highlighted specifically among Syriac writers. We may see similar things in the Alexandrian fathers or the Cappadocian fathers, but in particular, um, we see them in our own tradition, in our own writings that sort of define the way we think about reality, how we perceive reality in and of itself. And the first thing has to do with image, and that's that humans are created in the image and the likeness of God. And secondarily to that, beauty or shufro, shufro, as we say in Syriac, is reflected in God's image and by extension, Adam before the fall. Now, when I say Adam, you can think of a guy like Rajesh or, um, I don't know, Anup, um, Bill, you know, Jerry, whomever. But really, Adam is sort of a code word. It's not a code word. It's the Hebrew word specifically for human. So sometimes when we're speaking of Adam, we're being self-reflexive. We're thinking about ourselves. When we speak of Adam, we're speaking of what it means to be a human. And so Adam before the fall also has this shufro, this beauty. <clears throat> shufro, if you know Syriac, it's related to this root and Semitic languages in general. They are formed mostly, there's like, um, sorry, if I pause, it's to like monitor the, the audio feedback. Um, these languages, Aramaic, which is Syriac, Hebrew, Arabic, they're formed, words are formed by three letters, 90 to 95% of the time. There's of course exceptions, there's roots that are four letters, there's roots that are, well, let's say two. It's two with a wink, right? I won't get into the details of the language, but every word uses three letters to form a number of words. It could be 20 different words. So, shufro is shin, sh, sh, sh sound. Pe or p, 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 can be P or F actually in Syriac. And the last is resh, resh is r, r. This yields words like shapro. Shapro is the morning dawn. So in Syriac you'll say break sofro, it's a different word. But if you're talking about the dawn itself, when the light breaks and shines, it's shafro. We have the idea of shfirutho, which is um, beauty, beautiness, beautifulness, beauty. Um, we have another idea that's really prevalent in the writing of Ephraim the Syrian, um, that's shvito, and that's luminosity, you could say. So the idea of this beauty is related to cleanliness and brightness, shininess. Now, if you're familiar with the idea of glory, glory has a similar connotation, right? Of being bright and shining. Um, people imagine Christ in his glory, you see images where he's shining, right? So it's the same sort of idea. Well, Adam and Eve, in the transgression, they lose their garments of glory. Thus, you know, they realize, wow, you know, here we are in the garden, and they realize, you know, they didn't have any clothes on. Now, fast forward to the era of the incarnation. Our teaching is that Christ puts on Adam, right? He puts on the human, right? So that the human can put on Christ. So that Adam, who are us, that humans, can put on Christ. And in so doing, what happens? We, are, we attain our robe of glory again, right? There's a restoration in that. So we could say that Christianity, in the Syriac tradition especially, is the discovery of the image of God in the human person. Next slide, please. Just highlighting a couple examples from the fathers about this, Ephraim in particular, um, who asks, or he, he says, let us give thanks 
to God who clothed himself in the names of the body's various parts. Scripture refers to his ears to teach us that he listens to us. It refers to his eyes to show us that he sees us. It was just the names of such things that he put on, and although in his true being there are no wrath or regret, yet he put on those names because of our weakness. God puts on these things to communicate with us. He clothed himself in language so that he might clothe us in his mode of life. Now Ephraim goes on and says, you know, he, he, these are metaphors that he put on, though he literally did not do so. And so this idea of clothing and using something like human language as a vehicle for understanding reality in our weakened state. When I say weakened state, I'm referring to the obvious, that humans are limited. We are limited by a number of things, physically, mentally, whatever. Um, we can't apprehend the eternal God through the limitation. We can't apprehend the limitless with this limitation that we have and are. Uh, we can go to the next slide. It's sort of more of the same. I may skip it based on my rhythm here. Uh, but it's another father of the church who's referring to service and he's writing to the monks and speaking about, well, the word is poverty. And I think that he's using, I think that the English word poverty here refers to maybe the antiquated understanding of poverty and maybe not like um, a socioeconomic class today. It's the idea of bereftitude or being free from having anything. And so in advising the monks, he says, in the likeness of God, they also may serve in power and in freedom, which is not made subject and which is above laws and commandments, even as God. And to recount with our speech, the service of living motions of the perfect is impossible for us. And basically, you can uh, refer to this later if you want in, in the, you can hit pause in the replay of the live stream. But the idea is in trying to convey what the perfect is, you know, we will always have a futile attempt at doing so. We can't do it, right? But we can live through the likeness of God in order to engage the process. Okay, next slide. So how do we then talk about this way of experiencing God. We have several different teaching mechanisms, and these all could be classified as art in our contemporary world. But again, don't reduce these things to art, all right? So visual images, surotho, we could call iconography. Music, we have a tradition called the Bethgazo, this word means the treasury, and it refers to the treasury of melodies that we use in the church as our chant tradition. We have architecture, the aito. Aito is a very interesting word in Syriac, and um, you know, for the Arabic speakers, you will know this word sounds like aid, a holiday, a feast, aito is the Syriac word for church. We have two words, actually. You know, a lot of people, it's, it's fun to say, church means ecclesia, the, you know, calling out to summon people to you, to gather, ah, oh, the gathering. Knushto, we have that too. Um, if you're familiar with Israeli Knesset, the assembly, it's the same idea, same root. So this word, however, means the location where the feast, thus the Eucharist, is celebrated together. So that location, uh, these days, or at a certain point in time, typically after the legalization of Christianity in parts of the world where it was previously illegal, architecture became a means of conveying, from teaching, or describing the faith. And then along with that, some of it you may see tonight if you stick around, um, or tomorrow, <laughs> if you come to the liturgy, are the taxe. Now, this is, it's, we have other words, but this is the common word, and it's taken from Greek, tachis, if you've studied Greek. Uh, it just means the order, the rites of things. And so the various ritual action 
of the community is a teaching mechanism. We don't do things because they're nice or that's what your grandparents did because we're Malayali. Bakshay Malayaliala, okay? We don't do it because of that or we're Syrian or we're Coptic or whatever. We do them because they're teaching mechanisms. We don't have images on the wall of the church because they're pretty or maybe not depending on your position on things. We don't make sounds and melodies because they're cool or even appealing, right? They're, each thing is didactic. The same with the architecture, the way the church is set up. I mean, this is designed. Read uh, First Kings, you know, and read the description of the temple and the layout of the temple and how every piece of the architecture of the church is teaching you something about the different space that is generated between the sacred and the profane. And as you come and approach the divine, you, as you approach God, who is found in the Holy of Holies or the Beth Corbono, this, uh, call it a tabernacle, we have the same sort of structure that exists in scripture, but also is done in order to teach us about realms and how it is to approach God. In fact, our word for liturgy isn't liturgion. This is a nice Greek word, the work of the people. It's the texto, the kurobo alohoyo, the order of the divine approach. The order of the divine approach. What are you approaching it toward? Corbono. Corbono is the offering or the gift. And this is what we take um, when we take, in English we'll call it communion. So these forms help us to apprehend the infinite in our limited capacity. And I'll just go ahead and read my little paragraph here because I think it's important. We utilize forms to teach and condition our lives to be divinely inspired and ultimately to be in communion with God. In other words, when I say communion with God, I'm not just talking about taking the Qurban al-Qadisho, the, the holy mysteries or the, well, the divine offering, the communion meal, the Eucharistic meal. I'm talking about creating a life, a lifestyle where we once again walk with God as Adam did in the garden, as the human did when he was in God's presence, he was in the garden, okay? In other words, these forms have purpose, and like I said, they're not in in intended to be nice or pretty things. Sometimes they are, and then the rest is up for debate, depending on your tastes. Um, they're intended to be functional. They're intended to be didactic. They're trying to teach you something and condition us in a way of life so that life itself for us is God-centered, it's God-minded, it's communion-minded. Next slide, please. Please. So, um, images, since we're doing this icon exhibit, we'll talk about images today. And I want us to just be aware of a couple things uh, in human history. Namely, that images precede text. Text is a secondary development from imagery. It's always the case. Pictographs are stories that we tell. On the left, we have a cave painting. On the right, we have the Narmer palette. This is what we observe as the beginning of human writing in Egypt. Now, I picked this one because it's prettier. Human writing actually happens a couple, several hundred years earlier in Mesopotamia, in Sumer. So they, get, they win the race, but um, the Narmer palette is pretty cool. And here, um, there are certain elements of this image that begin transitioning to, um, or using the rebus principle. You guys ever play rebus games when you were kids? Like you'd have a, like if you're a kid and you had a paper and it had an eyeball and then a heart and then a U, what might that mean? I love you, right? And I do, okay? So, um, this is an exhibit of the earliest rebus, and it tells us the king's name, Narmer, okay? Um, all that to say, writing itself, if we talk about text, we think about text, text starts in images, because images tell stories. 
So how can you package more stories and more material while writing develops? And so now, instead of relying only on images, we have another tradition. We have a written tradition and a visual tradition. Uh, well, writing, it's, it's visual, but visuality. All right, let's look at some examples. So next slide, if you would. Now, uh, anyone recognize the image? Saying George, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyone spot a difference between the left and the right images? Apart from like, you know, don't give me one looks like, you know, your son drew it and the other. <laughs> um, yeah, light. And look at the animal below. Ooh. Very good. Uh, or, yeah, and so the serpent is a, you know, a, a key um, dividing light. Or there's, there's a moment in history and geography where that actually shifts. And you know, what was a synonym in certain parts of the world become different understandings and different. So what we have in the Syriac tradition as a serpent um, is visualized in the West, especially, but not just the West. I mean, it's, it's made its way back into the East as a dragon. The word, however, is harmono. Harmono is um, an animal. It's a horned viper, for the most part, we believe. This word harmono, or this root, um, also refers to cruelty. And so George, in the Acts of George, the Syriac Acts of George, he has a confrontation with, it's called a king, probably a, a governor or some kind of um, local leader. Depends on what you mean by king too, right? Like who's a real king in the days of empires, okay? Are you a client king? Are you just a boss man like a Malik in the Middle East, etc.? cetera? Um, and Didianus was his name, but he was called Didianus Harmono, Didianus the Cruel. But the word is synonymous with a snake. So imagery then can tell us the story. It can make reference to this story with a visual imprint upon us. Now, of course, stories, you know, develop over time or they're embellished or they're utilized to tell other um, important ideas, important stories, maybe um, highlight a different setting of something. In our tradition, this references the Acts of George in a, in a way that probably is uncommon outside the Syriac tradition. All right, next slide. So I just have a couple examples from some other icons. And look, um, when Achen or Abuna or Father Renjin said, you know, he's the best one, he didn't, um, he didn't contextualize what best means, the best one to talk to us about this. There's probably people out there who, at this part of the discussion, would be better. Uh, so there's a lot of details that I would miss. Now this is an image from the Ascension from the Rabula Gospels. Mar Rabula was um, one of our bishops who lived in Edessa. And on this image um, of the Ascension, you'll notice a bunch of things that you may find interesting. Some of these images are common across iconographic traditions. You may find a Greek or a Russian or a Coptic Ethiopian, I just don't know enough to say in comparison about that. But I wanna have you look at it for a minute and think about the story of the ascension from scripture. Because the image doesn't necessarily replicate what's in scripture, if you're familiar with those. And if you don't know, uh, look it up when you get home. Let's go in on a couple close-ups if you would. Go to the next slide. This is the upper portion of the Christ in the mandorla, or this um, large halo-shaped thing, um, conveying the essence of the divine, the essence of God, God and glory. Blue tends to be a divine color for a couple reasons. I'll talk about it more in a minute when I look at the transfiguration. Uh, but blue is related to the sky, to heaven. And so with that, it, there's a reference to divinity. Heaven and divinity are easily bound. Now, what's underneath Christ? That's different. 
Anyone recognize what that is? What's that? So sorry, my ears are terrible. Sarah? Flame, yeah, like eyeballs for sure, right? What's got eyeballs and wings and yeah, and what, what about these faces here? What's going on with the faces? I mean, there's one, there's a guy peeking up from the wings, you know, howdy do, we're in Texas, we can say howdy, right? Um, on the right, we have some kind of, well, it looks like a feline. On the left, we have some kind of bird, and below we have the um, Texas longhorn cattle, right? Oh, yes. Yes. And where does that imagery come from? Why are there wheels next? Yes. This is Ezekiel's vision. And so if you open to the New Testament, you start reading about the ascension. Are you reading about Ezekiel? Are you reading about this chariot where the ark, the presence of God is? Now, you don't know the story. Go back and, you know, read through the Old Testament and read how you know, the Israelites are so focused on the dwelling place of God. Where is that dwelling place? It is in the temple, right? They want to build this house. You know, David wants to build a house for the Lord. Um, the Lord says, no, I'm going to build you a house, meaning dynasty. Your son is going to build me this temple. Solomon builds the temple, Right? So the Israelites are focused on this idea of the divine presence is with us in Jerusalem, on his holy mountain, okay? Then something happens in 586 BC. Anyone recall? Yeah, our cousins, um, or you know, this Assyrian church is the descendant of these people. Um, the Babylonians, the Mesopotamians, the Babylonians come and destroy the temple. Not just that, they exile the people and the temple's destroyed. What happens to the ark? Kind of don't hear about the ark anymore. Um, hopefully, I was hoping some Ethiopians would come. Yeah, and, and we just don't hear about it, right? Now in Ezekiel though, he sees a vision of the, of the ark as this chariot. And it's mobile. It's moving with the people. So the people who thought they had God in their land are faced with a cold, harsh reality when the land is throttled and destroyed and what you thought was God's home is destroyed. And yet the prophet is saying, no, this is not what I'm seeing. God is with you. He's with the people, not the place. Right? And so here... In the ascension, we have this ark, this um, chariot, which is you know, holding the presence of God imagery, lifting up the word of God, or Christ the Logos, right? God the word. Uh, well, okay, we can uh, discuss the crowns being raised um, from below and elevated to Christ. Crowns have a lot of symbolism in Christianity. Uh, we see crowns when we see martyrdom. We see crowns at marriage ceremonies. Um, and so crowns are a symbol of rule and victory, um, of royalty. And so this from the human ex experience as Christians is rising up to Jesus. Maybe go to the next slide. We can look at the bottom while we have time. Uh, I'll just point out a, one interesting thing. If you look on the right, you see maybe two over from the right, someone with keys. Any guess who might that be? Then if you look two over from the left, you see a guy with a book who's bald, and he tends to be bald in all of his icons in every tradition, okay? Any guess who that is? St. Paul? Was Paul at the ascension? So here what we're seeing is a representation of an ontological uh, reality, like how is reality as it is, not as it was in history. In other words, how can we convey truth 
without being bound to the facts of an event. When we commemorate their tradition, the, when we commemorate the life of Jesus, we do it in a context that is um, I don't want to use fancy terms, uh, but in, in rested in eternity rather than temporality. In Greek, there are interesting words, keros and chronos. Keros is this notion of time as it is, meaning time and all time. In chronos, we have linear time or chronology. So we're not thinking about the events chronologically. We're thinking about what they mean for us as Christians and the church. How that draws toward Christ. How it draws us near this korobo, this approach. How it brings us near to God. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, just a quick look at the transfiguration. Interesting little icon here. Um, something similar. We can go to the next slide since this is, go to the detail. We see the same um, mandorla, this you know, um, sideways eye, crystal type figure. Now, in some icons, you'll see Christ robed in white, as the story goes. Um, here, he's robed in red and blue. And you'll see those colors on Christ in a number of settings, in a number of different types of icons. In some church, the Coptic church, it's the Pantocrator, the almighty icon that you see Christ like this. These colors are quite meaningful. Even though it doesn't look like a gospel, he was recorded to have been walking around, you know, in the flag of Texas, right? I mean, it's basically the flag. It's red, blue, and, and white. Uh, stars, and anyway, you see the stars on the right. Okay, never mind. So, why red and blue? What does Texas have to do with <laughs> Jesus, right? Well, red is an interesting thing, and, and maybe I should have wrote this out in a slide just to give you the visual along with it. I told you how Sabitic languages, whether it's Hebrew or Syriac, Aramaic, Arabic, they use these three letter roots to connect ideas. The word for man in Hebrew, Adam, Adam. The word for red, Aduma. The word for blood, the ma, or dam in Hebrew, but I said it the Syriac way, the ma. It means a number of other things, like the ground or the red ground is the avama, for example. So the idea of the human is conveyed by the color red. Adam and aduma, right? Blue, however, conveys the idea of the sky or the heaven. And when I say heaven and sky, like English, they're two different words. Malayalam, they're two different words, right? Uh, Swargam, is that our heaven one? I just remember from the paper. The other one I forgot, it starts with an A. There you go, right? That's where the birds fly. So, now, but in, in, the Ara, in Aramaic, in the Semitic languages, these are one word, Shmayo. Shemayim in Hebrew, Shmayo in Aramaic, same. And this idea in the ancient Near East, the sky, is actually synonymous with divinity, so much so that in cuneiform literature, when I say cuneiform, I mean the earliest writing that's done in clay, the symbol for the sky is the symbol for God. It's the same idea. So, in this part of the world, blue is recognizable with divinity. Red is recognizable with humanity. And here we have the clothed Christ in this image, reminding and teaching us of these things. Well, there's three peaks instead of one, right? The story goes that they meet on Mount Tabor. But, well, it's not Tabor alone, is it? Um, is this a reference to Horeb, where Elijah on the left stands, and Sinai, um, with probably the same mountain, different names? Um, this is... We can go to the next slide if we want. I don't know if I can say much about um, this portion. And there's been some work uh, about the cave and you know, relating it to the 
idea of different realms and even um, a revelation of reality, you know, like kind of going back off of uh, if anyone's work of, anyone's familiar with the work of Plato's allegory of the cave, you know. I don't know enough to speak to that, but it's something to investigate further, you know. And uh, it makes sense. It's, it's a good teaching. I just don't know. Maybe the Syrians are picking up on um, some Greek forms or uh, Plato's well known by the time this is created. And that's also true. We, that, that's a reality. Like the Greeks had been in the Middle East for 700 years um, by the time, then 700 years by the time this was produced, probably 800 years to be honest. Okay, we'll go forward. So I'm gonna, I think I've gone over time, but that's okay, I don't mind. Um, <laughs> we'll just push all the prayer and tell, tell the bishop to wait. Um, I'll wrap up with this thought, and that's the idea of inverted perspective. So if you're familiar with inverting things, it means kind of like turning them upside down, inside out, right? Anyone know what that thing is on the left? going to say you get paddled when you're bad right like it's no it's a mirror why'd you say it's a mirror it doesn't look shiny old works yeah yeah Yeah, I mean, yeah, so the form is indicating to you probably what it is, even though it's all tarnished. Um, and it's tarnished for a reason. It's made of metal. It's not a glass mirror in the, old, in the olden days, right? Um, they had metal that they would clean to have their own, you know, form appear on the side of the shiny metal. Well, the way in which icons grew and developed um, over the course of time, is that people started, how do I want to say it? Uh, I want to say it the right way so no one yells at me. <laughs> From the internet, not you guys. But um, people were with icons. People grew up and lived with this imagery. They would pray. They would be around this imagery. They would be um, in, I'll call it a meditative state, but I mean like a, a higher state. That's what I mean to say. And often, when they would look into the mirror, they would see the, or look into the icon, they'd see the icon looking back at them. And so there's a thought that grew and developed in the iconographic tradition of this inverted perspective. That is to say that the gaze from the icon starts from far behind the icon. And ultimately, it's a way of being self-reflective and as such, a type of mirror to reveal who and what we are. Uh, if you go to the next slide. In this, now the Syriac icon is in the middle and I picked a Greek one on the right just to give you a, you know, you may not recognize that's Jesus in the middle, that's why, okay? But in the, this is a very old Syriac icon of Jesus. Um, you see Christ looking back at you. Now, why is this important in the Syriac world? In our Syriac tradition, um, Ephraim especially, or at least it, we seem to start it with Ephraim. I mean, you could say Plato uses this device of, of the mirror, but Ephraim sees in the mirror, which has to be continually polished, continually worked, to go from looking at yourself with blemishes on it to working those blemishes out all the time until you have a lucid, shining, shvito image of yourself. Go back to the idea of beauty. Go back to the idea of glory, that shininess that is revealed to you. When you approach your life and you deal with imperfection, you have to work at it. And you keep working and working. Eventually, the image of God is reflected, right? And this is um, one, of the, one of the central ideas behind you know, imagery in our theology, okay? So the, the mirror is a, a prime example of this. Okay, well, last, um, that's going to be it for the presentation. You can go to another slide. I just think I have a, a goodbye. Yeah. 
um, sort of thing. I hope that not just the talk, forget the talk. The talk is designed to get you guys thinking about images in a different way. This isn't church decor. We're not decorating churches with this stuff. Okay? This is meaningful and it's designed to repurpose our thinking in our approach to Corbono, in our approach to God, in our approach to the religious life. So, um, I also, when I say a new movement, I hope that many of you take an interest in iconography, if nothing more than to learn about it, to incorporate it in your liturgical lives, to revive our own tradition that has gone by the wayside in many parts of the world, and for, for understandable reasons. I mean, I'm not blaming anyone. Sometimes, you know, I mean, the church has been on the run for 1,400 years, so it's reality. But I also want to encourage you to take up this religious practice. I don't want to say be artists because it's not limited to art. This is a devotion. Iconography is a devotion. And we remember this image here as written uh, or crafted by Luke, St. Luke, the physician. So if you're worried that your kids are going to be starving artists, just remember, you can be a physician and an iconographer and serving your church at the same time, okay? Um, we'll open the floor now for questions, Achen, if anyone wants to have a discussion. Yeah, we'll have five minutes. Uh, Achen is gracious to give us five minutes next to the time. Oh, thank you, Achen. Nandi. Do you have any questions or reflections? Yes. Well, <clears throat> there's a couple parts to that. I think different traditions would answer that differently. You may find some, and I don't want to speak to the Coptic tradition, uh, but you may find some traditions more closely aligned with Stoicism and less emotionally inclined. Um, what I would say is what I meant originally about that piece. They're not supposed to, they're not aiming to do what, um, call it, prof it's, I don't want to say profane, but uh, secular or non-religious art is in, intended to do. Um, and that could be, you know, I want to include my, one of my favorite images is um, housed at the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena. It's this girl, a young woman writing a love letter. And she just kind of like takes a breath and like is looking up. And that's the, the picture. And I'm like, you can feel her, you know, you can feel what's going on in her heart just with that one little image. But I think that that's something different than evoking a, an experience. And that could, for some people, be emotional. Um, it could be intellectual or cerebral. Uh, so that's probably how I would phrase it. It's not, I don't mean it anti-emotionally, but there may be different perspectives on what it's trying to do. In the end, it's trying to convey something. It's trying to bring us to a place and use that to teach us and move us toward God, the same way that reading scripture would. We read scripture, trying to bring us to a place, move us toward God, the same way that going through the rites of the Qurbana do, they move us toward God, right? Um, thank you. Any? I just want to add something to that. Yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah, and for those of you online listening, you may not have heard that, but Achin was saying that from the cognitive neuroscientist perspective or cognitive neuroscience perspective, all images evoke some kind of emotional response. Um, so there's that and the fact that there's a visual image, it's gonna evoke something, but the purpose of the Syriac tradition is to move us to a place and as such, it's, it's good to think of them as the visual gospel, right? You know, or at least the gospel and image. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's blue. Is that okay? So yeah. Black to me. I think it's it did. Yeah, I would say the ink, you know, is probably turning. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's blue there. Uh, Achen. So um, Father Zach asked if there's a network or something we could connect with that houses our um, present-day iconographers um, because some people think, well, there's no one to do the work. There actually is. I think most are in Europe, some are in the Middle East. Um, some are Coptic nuns who do things for our church. But um, I know the person who I would contact, Dr. Joe Benchaco, if he's watching. Um, <laughs> But I don't know that there's a formal network. And uh, it's something, I, I think it's the next step, right? I think, like, I'm just so happy with what you guys are doing here. Like it, you, you're really doing the right thing in this community and you're trailblazers because um, you're reviving who we are. You're not relying on what we became at a certain point in time because that's what the time was and that's how people did things and that's what they had access to. So I think even putting that together would be great. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. Uh, if you have other questions, you can see me afterwards. And um, I'm going to shut the mic down. Okay, we'll, we'll be staying here. Rachin is going to say a word of thanks. Thank you, Melfano, for this wonderful session. and. Uh, um, we, the Indian chapter of the Serene Orthodox Church, are unaware of the importance of the icons and what is iconography and all. So I was just discussing with Ranjanachan that we are going to dub your talk into Malayalam and teach our community what is icon and iconography of the Serene Orthodox Church. We will spend some money for that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, thank you, Malfono, for coming. And uh, Achen requested me to pray for you. He told me that you, your health is not okay in the recent days. So we will continue to pray for you and uh, I never thought that I will be able to get a chance to say a word of thanks to my professor in person and this is a moment God has given for me. And uh, uh, Dr. Mike is spending a lot of time in spreading the Serena Orthodox spirituality and theology and he is expert 
in n number of languages i can say maybe more than 27 he can, you, and you can you can read more than 27 right Yes, thank you. Yes, he's a researcher. And uh, um, so that's all on behalf of St. Ignatius Cathedral and the Mission Chapter, Chapel. I would like to say a word of thanks uh, to Dr. Wingert for your kind words. And... Uh, um, Ranjanachan is also one to support few words and then we would like to give you a small gift. Thank you for this attending. Yeah, and a special thanks to those who are attending this session in person and online. And thanks for all the volunteers who were working for the last few weeks to make this event a wonderful one. Thank you. Uh, as a token of appreciation, we would like to uh, present uh, the new icon uh, for the first time uh, to our Malfono. Uh, please do come forward and receive this icon from Abuna. Uh, oh, that's great. Nandi. Taudi lo mariyo. I mean, taudi, taudi galavai. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. This is cool. This is the new one, just outside. <laughs>